playing something which is extremely beautiful. So the goal of this lecture is to discuss the Lagrangian viewpoint to start uh, the, the, the first steps of uh, symplectic geometry. given many lectures on this subject, so my lecture notes are probably lying around someplace. But the, the good formal uh, books which are good in this, and you can know um, for the Riemannian part, his book is called Riemannian Geometry, blah, 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 I don't know the I don't know exactly the book, but somebody gave it to me here. I think you gave it to me. Thank you. Um, of course, it's a big book, so you only want to read the first part at first. And Arnold, you should always read Arnold if you have the chance. I mentioned this this morning. Uh, mathematical methods and mechanics. here but very much this transition and the many elementary treat, tra treatments of the last part so let me call this last part char for uh, char I don't know what to suggest but one one possibility is the book of uh, Dusan Macduff and Dimar Salomon. They wrote an elementary book on uh, symplectic geometry, which was published maybe, for me, not so long ago, maybe 20 years ago. So in fact, uh, uh, he's a friend of mine at ETH Zurich, and uh, one of our students here recently went there and did his master's degree. It's a nice place to do that. And 
and uh, this, this unfortunately Arnold I, I had many projects with Arnold but he's a little bit older than my generation and he died at a, too young he was too young maybe he died uh, 70 years old maybe he had a stroke I mean, he was he rode his bicycle all the time and one time he seemed to crash and uh, that was the beginning of the end probably starting to have some problem. So he, he's gone. But Joost is a director, of, also a friend of mine, of Max Planck uh, in Leipzig. You should know that in physics, so we have the honor of three physics people here. In physics, uh, the tradition in Germany to have Max Planck's Institute was very early after the Second World War, maybe even before, I'm not sure. Um, physicists are very smart with that, mathematicians are very slow. And the first Max Planck Institute in mathematics was in Bonn, and still is in Bonn, and is coupled also with the graduate school in mathematics in Bonn, which is a very nice coupling. But it is uh, founded by Hitzebruch and such people, and it is very nice. But then Joost and a couple other people founded, he's one of the original directors of the MPE uh, This MPE, this MPE uh, uh, is interested in applied. Uh, so mathematics and its applications. So Jürgen Joost is a very serious mathematician, for example, so, but he's also interested in applications, so there's a, a combined work with physicists. By the way, nowadays with, uh, Joost has gone into some, into some biomathematics, it's become very useful to go into bio. But he is a specialist in partial differential equations and differential geometry. And so, these, if you take a look at these books, they will help you. Duesenbeck Duff is in uh, Stony Brook in uh, uh, New York, Long Island. And uh, her husband is John Milder, so she, she uh, it's a nice mathematical family. Milder being a very important topologist, but having moved into some form of dynamics. <coughs> So, um, we have seen what's going on. Let me review from this morning. Uh, uh, we have the length functional of gamma. Um, and this is gamma as a curve from A to B. Smooth curve in the manifold. And uh, this is uh, what you think with respect to the metric. And we showed this morning, of course, the geodesic uh, intuitively, the, dis the distance between x and y is uh, the inf of the length of gamma from x to y. Almost always I will consider smooth curves at first, but here you should consider, for obvious reasons, piecewise smooth curves. So this is the distance, and this is given by the length. And as an elementary theorem that you can easily prove as homework exercise, that uh, this gives a metric, a distance function, Uh, on the manifold. You understand what I mean by that? That means the distance from x to y is equal to the distance from y to x. And triangle inequality, right? And that's trivial. But what, it, what you need to check is that if, if the, the distance is zero, then x and y is not, are not equal. So it doesn't hold for the pseudo Riemannian test. What? For the pseudo Riemannian case? I don't know. The pseudo Riemannian case becomes very delicate. I, uh, you know, 
this is a reminding case everything here. So this is reminding, so let me just re-emphasize this morning, but everything I'm saying now is, is in the reminding case. And it's a little bit delicate to prove that if, if the distance is zero, then uh, x equals y, because it's an infimum, right? And of course, the thing is, locally, if here's x, and then you take y out here, and you have some curve, locally, uh, g is approximately the standard metric. Let's say this is an uh, open neighborhood here to you. <coughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's, 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 a quite, it's a quadratic form, but it has eigenvalues, and the eigenvalues are non-zero because it's a, it's a non-degenerate positive definite quadratic form. And the eigenvalues move smoothly with the function. So on a local piece, these things are about bounded away from zero. They cannot go to zero on a local piece because of compactness argument. Okay. So that means that you really have a strong estimate between the, the standard norm and this norm. And that means that if you leave this guy, if you leave this guy, which you have to, this piece has to have length somehow estimated by the standard norm, right? Because it's bounded away from below and above by the standard norm. It's more or less the standard norm, not exactly, but bounded away. So that proves what that this is, this thing is a metric. This is, this is a distance function on it. Okay, that's a great thing, but I pointed out this morning that L is invariant by, coordinate by change of, param of the parameterization. <clears throat> that means you can take arc length parameterization can be used. And that means, and this means, that it's enough to study some, something much better, what the physicist told us to study anyway, the action, which here we call the energy. So this is the, the energy of gamma, or the energy function of curves, or in physics notation, action. And this is the integral of the, of the Lagrangian, which is a function. So gamma, let's say gamma of t is given in coordinates by x1 of t to xn of t. This is this morning, and we'll call this a vector x of t. So I'm looking locally in a coordinate chart now. So, and what we write here is x, x point, and t, dt. So here, in, in this one, uh, this, is a, this is a general setting. So the Lagrangian. Which defines an action or an energy. And here, of course, in our case, the Lagrangian uh, is equal to the norm squared. So it's a very simple, simple thing. Very simple. Yeah. So doesn't that mean that in our case, the Lagrangian is 1? What? So in our case, the Lagrangian is 1? I know what you mean. Because I said it's enough to uh, reduce the arc length. And so the answer is no. So <laughs> I understand your point. Um, 
the solution to, we want to find critical points of, the en of this energy or action. And in fact, the critical points will be uh, parameterized by arc length or some multiple of arc length. So that's good. But when you find critical points, we're going to find them right now. You, you do work like in high school. You look at f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Okay? That's what we're going to do here. So there's going to be some energy thing at some point, plus h minus the thing at, at another point, divided by h, and we'll take the derivative. Right? But this movement of h is any curve. So it kills this whole problem, it, this whole thing with arc length. So we have to now, we, we, I've just said, what is the arc length business? The arc length business says that any good curve, any critical curve that we want, is going to be auto, almost automatically parameterized by arc length. However, we're, we want to find critical points over all curves. You see what her original question was? Because in some sense, the answer to this question is arc length will be one, right? Because it will be parameterized by arc length. It's a funny thing, but I, are you OK on that now? OK. OK, so, uh, so the idea is, is uh, to look at this general situation. So all of this discussion here starts with length functional, distance, good enough to think about things with arc, arc length. But when you make calculus of variations, now I'm going, we're going to do something called calculus of variations. That means we're going to vary. We're doing calculus, but when you're varying not a point. x goes to x plus y. We're varying a curve. Gamma goes to gamma plus h. By the way, this is very nicely written in Arnold, and I will try to use Arnold's notation. Okay, I just looked it up. So I will follow our node. Uh, and he uses another notation, probably the Moscow note version of this thing. Phi of gamma equals integral a to b. Oh no, he doesn't use a to b. T0 to t1. Lagrangian of uh, x x dot t dt. Is everybody okay with that? Right. So x is now a vector valued uh, function, right? Because we're doing this in a coordinate chart. So I, I'll write it here to remind you. x1 through xn. Okay. Okay, it's a vector valued function. And you want to minimize that. You don't know how to minimize it, as I said this morning. So you take its first derivative and hope that you find a minimum. Don't forget your high school education. That's what you did. You minimize a function. You want to take the first derivative and then check. OK? That's what we're going to do. So we're going to, the, the goal is to find critical points. Is to find critical points. of uh, this action function. Now one thing if you read our node, by the way he did not have tech in that, that uh, time, and his translator also did not have tech, but somehow they had a good publishing company, Springer Verlag, and they have, they, if you have a function, they will write something like this, but in bold phase. And when they write that in bold phase, I'm just telling you how to read our note, because as I told you this morning, the first 80 pages of our note took me two months to read. And one of the reasons was notation. 
And this means gradient. Okay. And, and of course, what that is, is, is completely correct. Right? So it's great. It's, this derivative is the full derivative. It's the derivative of f, but as a, as a, as a not the differential. Not the differential, but the, just the derivative. So that, if you read Arnold, you will see in boldface, this thing is great. Okay? Okay. So let us start with Arnold. Let's start with calculus of variation. For my lectures here, I try to look up some history. It's very easy nowadays with the web. Uh, <clears throat> this first step in, in a, cal a calculus of variations is due to Euler. And this is a very long time ago. It's in the 18th century. And there was this mathematician, um, um, Here's where I go in the summer. This is Italy, but this, this part in here is called Piemonte. And the dialect of Piemonte, you, you understand right here is, uh, you know your geometry here. Is, this is Nice, it's very close to you. So France is very close to you. And the dialect here, the, 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 in fact, is, you know Italy is a very, very uh, new country. Italy, we know, is uh, founded in, after World War I, basically. So it's, it's a very new country. And it had many regions. So where I go here, I speak German. And where people here speak dialect, it's more or less some form of French. And there was a person here who uh, was named Lagrange, I probably misspell it. Lagrange. Something like this, maybe G, J, I don't know, Lagrange. And um, he was discovered, he was a very young uh, child prodigy, and at age 19 he was discovered by Euler. And Euler realized that his version of calculus vari of variations is much weaker than Lagrange, this young Lagrange. And so this first theory is due to Euler and Lagrange. And we profited here in Germany from that. Most people don't tell, tell this story because it's big. So you know Euler was forced out, was professor in Berlin. And he had some big fights with the Kaiser. And he left Berlin. I don't know the details of those fights. But as Euler being Swiss, it's probably related to money. So I'm joking probably. But, uh, uh, I've told you, uh, some of you know my stories. I have a very good friend who was negotiating with me. I was negotiating, we were with the, the, some minister of science, and I was the chairman, and he was a professor from Switzerland. And we were negotiating his salary with the minister. And his name is Italian because he's from Ticino. You know, the, the region in Switzerland, there's one region in Switzerland which is Swiss, which is Italian. It's called Ticino. And the, the minister said to him, I noticed that you're from Ticino, and then you uh, must be more or less of Italian background, and so on. And he said, my friend said, in this negotiation, I am Swiss. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't have some problems. So you know, he went to uh, you know the background. He went to uh, what was it called Saint Peter. It's called Saint Petersburg then. To what is Leningrad and now Saint Petersburg. And he he suggested that the Kaiser or whoever is the director of the academy in Saint Petersburg uh, in in Berlin hire Lagrange. So Lagrange came to Germany for a long time before he went to France. Uh, you can look up exactly the details, I've forgotten. But uh, 
And Euler, Euler realized that his, this young Lagrange had a very good uh, theory of calculus and variations. And he, I think, if I recall correctly, I think this gives you an idea. Euler gave a very famous lecture in something like that, where he explained what you should do in calculus variations. This is a long time ago. Okay, so uh, this is an old subject. I'm sure it was not made precise until the 20th century, but the general idea was absolutely. So this is the theory of Euler and Lagrange, very early, far earlier than Riemann, as you see, and far earlier than Lebesgue, uh, and it's the calculus of variations in order to find the criti critical points of a functional on curves, which is defined by Lagrange. Okay. So if you want to think of it. Think of that being Lagrange and that being Euler. <laughs> Euler Lagrange. Okay, so the idea, which you can read uh, anywhere, uh, is this. You just look at this. V of gamma plus H minus V of H. I told you we want to differentiate this thing, right? And now, maybe I'm thinking divided by h, but I'm not going to do it. <coughs> so what is h? Yeah? So you know, if th that's a number if you're doing differentiating functions. But here, uh, here is the curve gamma. And then you want to deform this curve gamma. And here we're going into what Maria is acting. Even though maybe I'm going to uh, uh, use arc length later on for this discussion. Uh, in the, in here, right now, I'm going to deform it by adding something to it, and who the heck knows what I added? I'm just adding any curve to it. Okay? So any smooth curve, so that here is gamma plus h. Now I want to, I want to, is there somebody called it? I want to add anything. So what about H? Uh, H, uh, H, I think H, we need to assume that H of A equals H of B equals zero. Right? So we, we want this to be, uh, we want to add zero here. Okay, so I'm in a coordinate patch, I know what that means. And I just add zero at the curve, so that's, that's what I mean. So let's calculate it out. So this is uh, <clears throat> where, by the way, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to assume. Let, let's assume that this this t is not here. I, it will never play a role in our case. So let's assume it's not even here. So P of gamma plus H minus phi of gamma equals integral from T1 to T0 of phi of X plus H um, X dot plus H dot. Okay, minus L uh, inside the integral here of x, x dot dt Okay, and okay, that's good. And now we write it very slow. Let's write it very slowly over here. I'm going to make a mistake. Where did he go? He, he's a physicist, so he needs to correct it. He did. <laughs> <laughs> 
give me back. He's going to the toilet. He can't stand it, so he has to go to the toilet. So, so, so L, let's write the Taylor series uh, L of x plus h, x dot plus h dot equals, okay, you have to help me here writing a Taylor series, okay. So, uh, here we go. Partial derivative of L with respect to x of x, x dot times h plus partial derivative of L with respect to x dot times h dot plus order 2. I'm assuming here L is relatively smooth. In our case, it's really about the smoothest thing you can think of. So there's, I'm not worrying about uh, delicate estimations of order one or small o or big o or whatever. This will pay it like no work at all. Did I make some mistake? I don't know. In the Taylor series, right? That's the Taylor series. Yeah, so you have L of x and x point, and then well, let me let me put it let me put it here. I, I think maybe I just didn't do it completely. Yeah. X x dot times h dot plus o two. Hmm? I can't hear you. You know. Oh, is that the second here? That's mine. So this is a Taylor series. Yeah. Don't forget, if you don't mind, this is a horrible a lot. Our new old Taylor series because, <laughs> right? Because this is a vector perturbation, and this is a vector derivative. This is a, this is the vector derivative. This is the vector derivative. You got it. You can think in one variable; it doesn't hurt. But, right? This is the differential of L evaluated at a, at this at this deformation, right? Okay. And now, this term is very good. This is a good term because we will divide by H. deformation with h, right? Subtract off the function, divide by h, take the derivative. Yeah? But what does that even mean? I mean, formally you can do it, but um, h is a curve, right? Formally you can do it, yeah. yeah formally you can do a lot of things. Yes, but I, I won't do it yet. So he's asking the question formally, what we, Arnold would just do this, but he, he would know it's correct. You're right, I can't divide by a vector, so it's a vector. H is a vector value of pertur perturbation, right? And so is H dot. But in fact, uh, in fact, you agree that basically, basically what we want to want to do, we want to make H small and take some sort of limit, right? And H point, I don't know what it is. I mean, how to make it, what's going on? That's all I mean by that statement. I'm glad you asked, but. That, Right now, that's just nonsense. Okay. And now uh, let's see here. And what happens? Integral from t zero to t one of d uh, d x dot. That's that variable, not not just not the derivative of a function. That's that variable on uh, x uh, x x dot of h dot, that appears in this integral, dt. And now our students in uh, Applied Calculus 1 would be very happy, except these are all vector valued, but it doesn't matter, because what you want to do if you see something like that is integrate by parts, right? 
this is what you want to do. You want to kill the derivative on H and, and pay the price. It's capitalistic. You kill the derivative on H and pay the price by uh, differentiating um, and so, uh, you will check me, I hope, this, I hope this is true. This is equal to this thing. So you came back because you knew I was doing something non-trivial now. And you missed all the trivial stuff. But he asked, he asked what, it, what did it mean to divide by a vector? So it, it, this is a good question. Yeah, I'll integrate by parts, so DDT, L, uh, uh, x dot uh, x dot um, of H uh, right that gives this term except I have to minus off this term please check me I'm going to make a mistake here as you know uh, what, that gives that term, and what I have to subtract off is, is this term, right? I hope, I hope I did it right. X dot uh, Let's check if I did that right. Uh, I think I did it right.
times h dt. This this uh, <clears throat> um, so it's critical for E if and only if. Well, not with all, not with all, uh, not with H, yeah. But uh, for example, uh, let's let's put here norm H, some sort of norm of H goes to zero for all H. Now I'm not dividing by, uh, I'm just saying this has to be small. And so what does that say here? You've got H involved here, right? So, but that says that H is free for me to choose. And now choose, choose uh, H to be any cutoff, any cutoff function. So, which is one at a certain interval and then down to zero. You see? Yeah. And so you see what this implies is, of course, that the integral, that, excuse me, that what you have inside has to be zero. And a cutoff function. Well, it's a cutoff vector value function. Um, So something is critical yes. if up to order two terms that you can forget, its derivative is zero. Here its derivative is this terrible integral, except we have to we have to take this limit. The, the derivative will be more something like this. This is a vector derivative. Right. The derivative has to be zero for any h. You get any nearby perturbation, it has to be, this is called the calculus of variations. We're taking the curve, and we're looking at all perturbations of the curve, and it's saying that the derivative for all perturbations of the curve has to be zero. Right? So I can choose h, or you can choose h. So what we do is we choose h to be one here, and go down to zero here where it doesn't count. Right? And so we just get this thing, uh, and the only way for that to go to zero is for this. Okay? Yes? Um, we so first you are writing the Taylor expansion, and then you're calculating the interval of one of the terms in the Taylor expansion, and how, how does that relate to x being a critical point for e? Well, I didn't get any of this, so you, it's too so, fast for me. So, I don't understand why, uh, well, doing all that Taylor expansion and everything, how does that relate to x being critical for e? I have to define what it means to ask something to be critical yes. for E. And I say that something is critical for E if it's the derivative values. Okay? That's the definition of critical point. I have to define in some way what is the derivative. This is one reason the analysis on infinite dimensional, this is infinite dimensional space here, that's one of the problems, right? That, that we're moving H in some infinite dimensional space. Right. 
So one of the definitions would be exactly what I just wrote down on the board. For all, for all h, this derivative vanishes. And when, when we divide, he asked me about dividing by a vector, but just divide, divide by the length of h. So that, that limit has to vanish for, for, for all h. And now h is in my hands, right? h is in my hands. I can take any perturbation of the curve into the space of all curves, which is a terrible space. But I take, I take cutoff function, cutoff curves, if you like. I mean, I, which you, you can see what I mean. Just some, some sort, of, sort of cutoff thing. And, and show that, in fact, the only way that can happen is if this der generalized derivative goes to zero, which you rightfully asked about, for all h means that, that, in fact, what I have inside has to be zero. Okay? You can easily check it, and I checked just now in my office what's in our Nolan. He makes this argument very precise, but that's exactly what he does. He takes that off and so on. Okay, it's the usual thing. Well, that is a very, 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 very beautiful thing. This equation here is a differential equation. Yes. It is written as one equation in the notation of our node, but it is n equations where n is the, uh, goes from, is the dimension of the manifold, right? Because this is a vector value thing, this is a vector value thing, this is a vector value thing. So this thing here is the Euler-Lagrange equation. <clears throat> and it's an ordinary differential equation. It's the second order ODE. smart enough to look and think, and that person is probably somebody like maybe Chivita, because this whole business existed before we understood the notion of connection. Okay? And that's what Deepak, Deepak or Deepak, how do you pronounce it? Deep, Deep, not Deep. <laughs> In your language you have the, uh, eh, what kind of sounds do you have, like eh, eh, uh, 
You know the English word deep. Is it the same E as in, in D? Yeah, D. D. It's in D. Yeah. Okay. He mentioned that I forgot a key point. So if if you take Nabla, okay, to be the Levi Chivita connection. Of G. We talked about there's this unique symmetric metric connection of G. Then the connection ODE and the Euler Lagrange ODE are identical. something very very right, very correct in this in this calculus of variation. Yeah. You recall what I mean. This morning I talked I reminded you what the connection o, ODE is. You talk about parallel transport and it's parallel, the curve is better and so on. It's the same, it's identically, it says that you write down the structure constants and they are exactly the Christoffel symbols of, of the situation. So it means that you can because the differential equation here obviously involves derivatives of, of the metric, right? Because you differentiate it around it here. So it says that the Christoffel symbols are expressible as derivatives of the metric. I could write them down maybe, but I'd make a mistake. Okay. You probably already, you've seen this. The Christoff Christoffel symbols can be written in terms of the metric. And, and so that's, that's a wonderful thing. And it's, uh, Maybe not surprising. It says that we have the right notion on both sides of the equation. But the interesting thing is maybe Chivita and his whole idea of connection and Riemann and so on. This is more or less 1900 Christophe Summa. And Euler Lagrange is, is in the 18th century. So there's a tremendous development of time before people understood something. And here's a fact. Let's call this uh, dagger. And it uses dagger. <clears throat> yeah. So, does this mean that um, only for the unique Vita connection do we have that um, that the curve parallel to itself is a 3D set? Say it again. Only in the case where we have um, uh, the metric curve. connection, which is symmetric, the Levi Chivita connection, yes. yes. Where the curve is par uh, parallel to itself becomes exactly the huge lesson. Yeah, because uh, you have to have something that's related to the metric in a strong way. Mm -hmm. So I, I see what you're saying. There might be some other connection that's related to the metric in some other strong way that still uh, does the job. I think the answer is no. I think, you're, I think this is forced on us. And you may, it's interesting you ask that because in the pseudo Riemannian case, I mean, you have the connection and so on. I mean, right, you don't need to think about this metric. So, right. so in some sense, you, you want to think here, which is cor correct for you, I think, in my opinion. And you would like to know what is the way to uh, avoid going here. Right, because if you start talking about length and you get outside the light cone and so on, I don't know what's going on. I mean, it's a very mysterious thing, right? I don't know, your physics people understand this probably very well. I don't know. <clears throat> Here is a fact that uses this that I'm going to. So, so this is a second order ODE word I write this. All right? And this is then a first order ODE. On the tangent bundle. Right? This the thing I talked about this morning. You take it's the usual way. It, 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 yeah. The geodesic flow 
either to minimize the integral by the Euler Lagrange equation, or to have parallel transport of the curve equal itself, this geodesic flow is a first order ODE on the tangent bump. Okay? Okay? As I said and screamed at you this morning, there's a local one parameter group action. Right? Yeah. So there's a fact that's a calculation here is that the norm square G is invariant by the local act local group action. I'm going to get mad. I, I really like Maria, but I, I'm going to get mad, not at Maria, but at the, 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 the terrible didactics in mathematics, and my friend gave on it's not his fault, is an ODE is, a first order ODE is a local one parameter group action. That, it is that. You can write it down with derivatives and blah, 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 but it is a local one parameter group action of diffeomorphism. Punct. I don't know how to say punk in English. Period. Okay? Please. Okay. And please think of it this way. Here's the manifold. Yeah. And here's the time axis. And if you have a point in the manifold, you can integrate the differential equation with the local action for a certain time. You know that. For a certain time, you can integrate any differential equation. This time length that you have, where you can integrate this thing, depends on the point in the manifold. So if you have another point, maybe it's a smaller time interval. If you have another point, maybe it's another time interval. Maybe sometimes it's the global time interval. The domain of definition of the one parameter group action is this open set. Okay. One parameter group action means G of T plus S is equal to G of T composed of G of S. Excuse me. <laughs> yes, that's all there is to it. Wherever it's defined wherever it makes sense. Because you might have, you might integrate here out to something, and then you might integrate here too far, and so on, and, and, and so on, yes? You go to some point in the manifold, you don't have much more. Okay? 